So to, to help illustrate this, I've given you kind of a, a scale, if you like, to see how we can interpret, well, perceive how these verses have been interpreted. So save through faith with works. This is the, the sinless perfection end of the spectrum. Based on the latter passages in chapter 3, you have to be absolutely sinless to be saved, right? And so they will say then that 1 John 1, 8 to, to 2, 2 is about sinners repenting of their sins and, and turning from it until they have fully surrendered, or however they will phrase it. On the other hand, on the other extreme of the spectrum, you've got saved through faith without works, and that's what the Bible calls grace, okay? God has, and, and people will say, people often say this, that God has forgiven all sins, past, present, and future, and for as long as you still live in this body of the flesh, you're always going to sin. And therefore, according to 1 John 8 and 2 to 2, we, we acknowledge this, so we believe in Jesus. That That's how they will often interpret it on, on the, the faith alone side. In the middle, with the lordship salvation, it's kind of like saved through a true faith alone that will produce to produce works. You know, it's like one foot in there, one foot in there. Based on the later passages in chapter 3, there, there needs to be some evidence of changed life to be saved, but it, it doesn't mean perfection. So 1 John is kind of like acknowledging when we sin, God, for, God is faithful to forgive, as long as there isn't a lifestyle of sin. And so that, that's how they will interpret it. Okay. So where do they get their interpretations from? Well, verse 8 is really problematic to a sinless perfectionist. So they, they have to assume that it essentially means the same thing as it does in verse 10, that, that you are denying that you have past sins that you need saving from. So it, it doesn't mean that you have present sins because that would contradict other verses in John, supposedly. So they really just say that verse 8 is just the same thing as verse 10, just said in a different way. Uh, and that they will use verse 6 preceding it to set the context for it because if, if we are not in the truth, we, we walk in darkness, quote-unquote. So verse 8 cannot mean that a saved Christian continues in sin in the present tense because that would contradict walking in darkness in verse 6, right? Uh, now, using a, a non kjv translation, um, they will insist that verses such as 1 John 3, 8 are outright proof that a save, saved believer should not be continuing in sin. So the idea that a Christian is always going to sin um, based on 1.8 is quoting it out of context and in, in ignorance to... Um, sorry, I forgot to complete that sentence for some reason, but in, in this one, and there is a bit of a thing about how this says practice of sin. The King James doesn't say that, but that'll have to wait to chapter 3. So um, I looked around at how sinless perfectionists answered this, and so the, these are a few of the things that I found. So this guy, he's, you know, hardcore term for me sins to be saved. So uh, he says, essentially... Uh, verse 6, if we continue in darkness, this proves that verse 8 does not mean continued present sin because we, we can't be walking in darkness. Okay. In 2 John 2, 18-19, we have these antichrists that went out from us. Well, this shows that the epistle was written about the Gnostics and they had all kinds of heretical teachings. And uh, further qualified in 1 John 4, 1-3, where it says, test the spirits, you can clearly see that he is addressing the Gnostics, right? And supposedly, the Gnostics claim that they didn't have any sin. Uh, he also says, uh, and this is obviously true, that if you it's a letter, so if you take out the chapters and numbers, read it in the flow of a letter, obviously the chapters and numbers weren't there when John wrote it. So that, that's some of the points that he's made about it. Now, uh, this guy, Dan Mowley, you wouldn't normally think that they belong in the same camp, because you might not actually realise that he's a sinless perfectionist, because he's really more about um, identity, kind of a gospel, which is something that he would refute. But... Um, I think he, he does really kind of believe it. It's just he says it in a very nice way and uh, a much more gentle way than most people. And he kind of says it without saying it, really. So it's maybe not obvious that he's a sinless perfectionist. But, you know, he believes that essentially you're walking in a new identity and your new identity is that you don't sin. So verse 7, if we walk in the light, and, and he'll embellish that to say, if we come clean, come free from ourselves, get in true fellowship with him, and it cleanses us from all sin, righteousness it's done. So uh, we're not dual-natured, we're not driven by sin, not desperately in need of the blood every single day, not, oh, thank you, God, I'm always going to sin, but he forgives me. So, so he's, he's refuting that kind of a mentality, yeah? And so... Um, being cleansed from all sin, that, that means all our sin, which he would, uh, although he doesn't say this, it, it seems like he's saying that it includes your propensity to even sin. That's completely removed. So even your desire to sin essentially is removed. He's kind of saying it without saying it, really. So in the context of verse 7, verse 8, if we say we have no sin, he, he interprets that as meaning if you say you have no need for the blood. So it doesn't mean if you sinned today. It just means do you recognise that you need Jesus? So the person who says, I have no sin, he's basically saying, I don't need to be born again. I don't need Jesus. I'm a pretty good person. That, that's how he's defining that so in verse 9 when it says if we confess our sins it doesn't interpret this to mean that we're always going to have sin but if we stumble then the light of my life reveals that recognizes that it wasn't god and my mindset was selfish and i get convicted etc so i say father so this is what i mean about the identity thing where it's just like proclaiming truth over yourself essentially and that that's how you get around the sin issue apparently um, this guy, One Reality, again, hardcore work, salvation, come, comes right out and says it. Um, Christians read this, he will say that Christians read this with a mentality that they're always going to sin till the day they die. Sorry, I've spelled that wrong. And this is why pastors apparently molest children or are cheating on their wives and Christians think that they have to deliberately sin to be in the truth. 
I've never heard anybody say that. That's what he's saying. Uh, John is writing to Gnostics, there it is again, who, who think that they have not sin, sinned since birth and wouldn't need Jesus who are converting over to Christianity. Not sure why, but that's what he says. Uh, John does not address believers until chapter 2, supposedly. So in verse 9, we confess that we have sinned and we are cleansed from all unrighteousness, so we cannot have sin, present tense, according to verse 8. So, uh, in essence, then, this passage is about an unsaved person getting saved, that they will confess their sin and, in his words, repent of their sin and get saved. So that, that's how he's interpreting it, okay? Um, Jesse Morrell, so uh, I've put the videos in the video titles in there if you want to check these out, but uh, he'll say that a lot of Christians use this to attack holiness preaching. I don't know who, but that's what he says. John was writing against the Gnostics who believed that the flesh was a sinful substance and that you could never be free from sin until you die and you're released from the body. Uh, walking in darkness, verse 6, is walking in sin and wa walking in righteousness, not walking in the truth. So it's also important to note that he interprets cleansing from all sin as referring to in this life and it means that you no longer have the propensity to go out and sin. That the saviour cleanses from all sin is, is not death as the, the Gnostics taught. Uh, now this is noteworthy what he said that if somebody commits a sin such as fornication but then they claim they're not being sinful this is the kind of person that the passage is talking about uh, he also says as well that a lot of people interpret the bible based on today's debates like calvinism versus arminianism rather than the issues of the time and the, the audience of, it, of its day okay so you know we're maybe misunderstanding the argument because we're looking at it from you know modern argument point um so he says that the whole point of telling you to confess your sin is that you get forgiven and cleansed and don't continue in sin, by which he, you know, Jesse Morrell means repent of it, stop doing it altogether. Uh, noteworthy as well is that according to 1 John 2, 1, it says, if any man sin, that means it's possible to sin, but it's also possible to stop sinning because he wrote the epistle that you would not sin. Uh, he does also point out another uh, false extreme that, that some sinless perfectionists say it is impossible for a saved person to um, sin. And uh, this is exactly what Mike Rakowski believes, the next guy, that uh, he, he does believe that he's at a point where he cannot, he, he can't even choose to sin. It's impossible for him to sin, essentially. So uh, basically what he says, everyone on this earth except Jesus was born in sin. That does not mean we will always continue in sin. There are no scriptures that say, well, he, he always says relate. He has some weird obsession with using that word, that we will always continue in sin or that we can never stop sinning. The, the Bible never says this, supposedly. Um, people who do not possess the Holy Spirit want to justify why they continue in sin. So when it says, if we say we have no sin, it, it does not apply to his own claim that he does not sin anymore because he confesses that he was was born in sin and for 50 years of his life he lived in sin he then confessed his sins and so he stopped living in sin so again it's this it's about unbelievers getting saved in, in you know in long story short he then quotes a later verse from john that whos uh, whosoever has be, uh, been born of god does not sin and he cannot sin because his seed remains in him and the wicked one uh, cannot touch you so if you are allowing the holy spirit of god to guide you you will not sin now additionally uh, if you've not heard of this guy before um Rikowski's doctrine of overcoming sin also involves overcoming sickness so if you get sick it's because you sinned and, and sin and sickness come come from the devil and it's later clarified in 1 john 3 that whosoever sins has not seen him and does not know him so if you say you still sin it's because you don't know god don't have the holy spirit have no idea who god is you're the one that's living a lie you are deceived you are blaspheming the word of god and so essentially saying that if you still sin you are denying the power of god essentially is what he's saying there so that was sinless perfectionism. What about the opposite end of the spectrum? Free grace, easy believers, and where do they get their interpretations from? So uh, verse 8 obviously is fine as a self-contained verse if we say that we have no sin in the present tense. So uh, free grace advocates would say that believers sin even to the day they die. So because this verse is in the present tense, that there's no problem for uh, easy believers about what verse uh, 8 means. Now, verse 9 is surprisingly controversial among uh, free grace advocates because different people have interpreted it in very different ways. And some people have even reconsidered their interpretation. You might argue perhaps that how the word confess uh, is interpreted could be an issue there. Verse 10, again, not, not controversial. There's, there's no issue with verse 10. So uh, I'll give you an example of uh, things I've heard from other easy believers to say about this passage. So uh, initially, uh, Greg Jackson once did a video where he stated it was direct, directed at the Gnostics. And the Gnostics claimed they didn't have any sin. And so they needed to acknowledge that they were sinners who, who needed to trust in Christ. Um, some people have refuted him about this view, stating that it refers to believers, but he's declined this view because it would involve ongoing confession, such as in uh, Catholicism. And so that obviously that would be maintaining forgiveness as opposed to one-time forgiveness. Um, now, I think he, he did change his view, that he's, his view has changed and that to be more in agreement with the second guy, although they disagree on many other things, which I'm not going to get into. But um, destroying the works of the devil, uh, he said that uh, he disagrees that this verse is about believers as well for much the same reasons as greg although rather than saying it's about the gnostics he's saying that it refers to unbelievers generally who need to confess their sins in, in the john the baptist sense like you know the one-time confession conversion because they've not yet believed the gospel and when 
people have confronted him about the use of the pronoun we because it says if we confess our sin and obviously the, the context is believers he, he likens it to um i think there was a waitress in a restaurant saying oh what are we having today but the waitress herself is not not eating right um and then toronto bible study he's uh, said that this passage i think uh, and I, I apologize to him if i'm wrong about his interpretation but it refers to ongoing confession of sins to god not not for salvation so it's not something that you have to do to be saved but something that maintains your earthly fellowship or relationship with God, unless you can get chastised or perhaps disfellowshipped from the brethren or something like that. And so um, then there's Lordship Salvation. Now, among Lordshippers, I didn't really find anything surprisingly different from what we've already seen. It's mainly a repetition of some of the same points. And so it's kind of a mishmash of the aforementioned points that, you know, the, the epistle was written to the Gnostics or because they reject sinless perfections and they will acknowledge the ongoing sins of believers, but at the same time, they'll still insist that walking the light must warrant a change in lifestyle, uh, not making a, a practice of sin. So I didn't, I didn't really find anything new in that category to, to handpick for you. So there's a lot of different arguments going on here and, and quite a lot to unpack. So I'm going to have to break down and refute some of the arguments. I can't go into every micro thing that they've said for the sake of time. But um, just as a spoiler alert, I don't really agree with any of the aforementioned interpretations, including those by other easy believers. And I'm not, you know, I'm not having a go at them or anything. I just professionally disagree with them. But I, I have previously considered Toronto Bible Studies interpretation. And for a time, I thought it was correct. But then when I've studied it again... I've kind of repented of that view, and I'm using that word correctly, by the way, because uh, I've realised something very obvious that I missed the whole time. And when I saw it, I couldn't believe how obvious it was. All of these conflicting interpretations explain why John's epistle is such a complicated book, because the things that John is saying in these verses is not really complicated in of itself. He's using quite simple language, and so it's amazing how so few words can cause so much conflict about what he means. The answer to this passage is actually quite simple. And when I noticed it, I felt rather silly that I missed it the whole time, because it was always there. And all we have to do is just think carefully about the way that John phrases it and the reason why he says certain things. That's all you have to do. You know, just think carefully about why he's saying it, the way that he's saying it, right? So I'll try and pick some of the main arguments. I can't go through every micro-argument, but uh, easy believists and sinless perfectionists alike have interpreted this epistle to be all about Gnosticism, but they've taken their own spin on what Gnostic doctrine John was actually refuting. So if we ask the sinless perfectionists who say that John was writing about the Gnostics, well, they say that the Gnostics lived in sin and wouldn't turn from sin, and so that was the issue that John needed to address. On the contrary, easy believists, who also say that this book was directed towards the Gnostics, denied that they had sin or that Jesus was the Christ, and so that was what one John addressed. So either one or both of these sides are picking and choosing the aspects of Gnostic Gnostics to associate with this epistle so as to defend their own positions. And in some of their assertions about Gnostics are not really necessarily accurate or evident evident from the writings that we have about Gnostics. They're either cherry-picked or they're conjectural or, or just simply not true or relevant, really. Um, further building on this, you see, my biggest problem with this assertion is the lack of evidence within the Bible itself. John makes no mention of Gnostics or Gnosticism, uh, and we have uh, we have to rely on extra biblical sources and conjectural assumptions to come to this conclusion, essentially. Now, there's a lot of um, hearsay about this epistle that John wrote it quite late in his life, even after the Temple of Jerusalem was destroyed, but doesn't bother to mention it. But scholars can only deduce that based on his writing style. They don't really have any absolute proof. Uh, many scholars would deny that John even wrote the book. So um, John didn't really find it necessary to document anything particularly relevant to his time frame. So in summary, I, I reject the idea that it's targeted at Gnostics specifically because uh, you know, I don't think that that sets the premise for the whole book because you, you cannot establish that from the Bible itself. It, you know, Somebody has to plant that idea into your head, essentially. Now, um, most of what we know about Gnostics, as, as far as I'm aware, comes from Against Heresies by Irenaeus. So I actually produced a video going through the book to debunk a claim that Osas was a Gnostic doctrine. The, the Gnostics really believed in all kinds of kooky, weird things, assuming that what Irenaeus said is actually true and not biased, uh, by the way. But um, they believed in all kinds of weird things. And so really, John writes his epistle, what he writes in his epistle barely scratches the surface of what Gnostics actually believed. And the Antichrist characteristics that John exposed were quite specific. So really, I would argue that his epistle is very inadequate if it was intended to address Gnostic teachings. To top this off, really, the Antichrist characteristics could easily be applied to the Jews of John's time, who also denied that Jesus is the Christ and, you know, also denied that they had sin. And Paul warned us about Judaizers in his epistles. Now, strictly speaking, John doesn't mention Jews in his epistle, right? But at least internally, the Bible would make a much better case for that claim and a more self-sufficient case than the Gnostics, okay? Just from the self-sufficient internal evidence. And furthermore, as well as I mentioned earlier in the study, Sometimes the Bible does name certain people that were the cause of certain false doctrines, like the Nicolaitans, right? But John doesn't give us that in epistle, so we don't know that it was targeting a very specific group of, of heretics. So John just said, um, another argument then, this is quite a big one, a lot of the sinless perfectionists were saying this, that John just said, prior to verse 
8, 9 and 10, walk in the light before saying if we say we have no sin. So he is not talking about present tense ongoing sins. Now, I perceive that there are two problems with this argument. The first biggest problem is that it's really begging the question, that is to say, asserting the conclusion, because the sinless perfectionists have read that word, that, that phrase, walk in the light, and they've pre-decided that that's what walking the light means. Well, it says walk in the light, so it means you don't sin. Well, it, well, you've decided that that's what those four words mean. Okay, you've made that assumption. So really what they're doing is they're using a cryptic figure of speech, like walk in the light, to define a clear statement if we say we have no sin, rather than taking the more obvious statement and applying it to the more cryptic one, right? Which, you know, would make more sense. Well, earlier in this study, we already looked at what walking in the light means, that if, if we use all the passages in the Bible, particularly in John, mainly in John's Gospel, that use this same phrase, walk in the light, it's really used more to do with believing who Christ is and believing in him, not in living a new kind of a life, okay? That's how John's Gospel defines it far more clearly. So, if John's borrowing terminology from his gospel in his epistle, which we can see that he does, it's really far more to do with what you believe, not your works. And so the closest works-like passages that we have that are similar are like walking in the spirit, not walking in the light, though, or walking as children of the light. So, you know, John's gospel presents a better case for our interpretation, that walking in the light is really the truth that you believe. It's walking in the truth, acknowledging what is true, believing in what is true. The second problem with this argument, okay, if we're to assert that the sinless perfectionist view is true, that walk in the light means not sinning, then really the way that the Holy Spirit moved John to speak makes absolutely no sense whatsoever because John wrote a sentence that contradicts his own salvation doctrine, right? Logically speaking, if a sinless perfectionist's view were true, that Jesus has to remove sins, not just the sins that they've done or the penalty for sins, but also the propensity to sin or, you know, the fact that they sin. And this is how we're going to define free from sin, that you're a person who doesn't sin anymore. Well, then John cannot say in the present tense, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Because it's not true. In fact, the opposite is true. It's if we say we have sin, we deceive ourselves. So we really accuse John of writing a nonsensical statement that doesn't even match what he's proclaiming about salvation. If you just follow the logic, right? We've been set free from our sins. That's how they interpret Jesus cleansed from our sins. We don't sin anymore. We're not living in sin. Uh, you know, we've been cleansed from all of our sins. We don't have sin anymore. Oh, by the way, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Like that. What? That, that, that doesn't make sense with the soteriology that you're supposedly claiming then. It's, it's like you're making John contradict himself. Now, verse 10 still makes perfect sense if we say we have not sinned. That's fine. We don't have a problem with verse 10. But they're making verse 8 say the same thing when John worded it in the present tense, not as something that happened in the past. Okay. The third argument then, um, that verse 9, and you know Dan Mola said it this way, but also easy believists have said this as well, that confess means to acknowledge our need for the blood. So like, like Dan Mola said, it's about unbelievers getting saved. You know, if we say we have no need for the blood, that's what John really means by saying that. But my answer to that really is very similar to, uh, to argument two. Like my, my question would be, if this is what John really meant, why couldn't the Holy Spirit move John to say it in the way that he meant? Because really the verse ought to say, if we say we have no past sin, then we deceive ourselves. But that's not what he said. He said, if we say we have no sin, present tense, we deceive ourselves. And then verse 9 ought to say, if any man acknowledge his need for the blood of Jesus, he is faithful for it. But again, that's not how the Holy Spirit moved John to speak. The Holy Spirit moved John to say, if we confess, that's an action, present tense, our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive. Okay? I am satisfied in my own mind. You can disagree. That's up to you. But I think John is being deliberate in the language being used and that the Holy Spirit did not write him to move something that is deliberately confusing okay so you know how just looking at that right there that table there of what john could have said versus what he did say would help you understand why i'm disagreeing with everybody here okay um argument number four is that john is talking about unbelievers verse 8 to 10 are not referring to saved people they're about people who need to get saved now um as we saw with gnosticism both easy believists and sinless perfectionists alike are making this claim but they've got their own spin on how it actually applies uh, you know the sinless perfectionists will say that it means unbelievers need to repent of their sins the easy believers say that unbelievers need to recognize that they are sinners once again with argument two and three we're accusing john and the holy spirit of using nonsensical language that doesn't make doctrinal sense okay verse three and four quite clearly clarify who we are now in poetry books like psalms or job or songs obviously this is not as straightforward because the pronouns flip around all the time and it's poetry right but this ought to really be this is an instructional letter it ought to be more straightforward than that okay no, no verse so far has redefined who we are okay we are the brethren the people of god so now some will say it's a figure of speech so i mentioned earlier that the waitress example like a waitress comes up to you and say well, oh what are we having today but the waitress is not uh, eating now i can't accept that for the main reason i find that view very conjectural i find it unverifiable like i i can't verify that what you're saying is true i've got no way of knowing that i, I can only base it on your assumption right and really I, I don't think you can compare informal speech 
in a restaurant with with men speaking as they are moved by the Holy Ghost and wrote and carbon copied this letter. Okay, so you know I, I'm not having a go at the people that proclaim that. You know I'm not ripping on them all, but you know that I'm, I'm just professionally disagreeing with other, other easy believers about this. Uh, argument five is that it means to stop living in sin, and this is essentially how Jesse uh, Morell and Mike Rakowski interpret. Well, I suppose all the sinless perfectionists did really, but as as with all the previous arguments were doing the same thing again, accusing John of writing nonsensical language that contradicts his own theology. He should not be saying, if we say we have no sin, present tense, if we have been cleansed from our sins and we don't sin anymore and we don't sin because we're children of God and you all sin, but we don't. You know, you deceive that yourselves, we don't. John should not be saying that. It makes no sense with what he's actually talking about. And again, it's inserting the conclusion because what they're doing is they're reading the bit saying cleanses us from all sin and they think, well, that means you don't sin anymore. Well, the thing is that that's not what cleansing means, right? Cleansing, like another word for cleaning or, you know, scrubbing. Now, anybody who knows the first thing about cleaning knows that when you clean something, it eventually gets dirty, okay? Those of you that are clean freaks and like to clean your house, or maybe you're a housewife and you're looking after the family, you know that as soon as the kids and the husband come home, that house ain't as clean as you made it. No matter how much effort you put into it, it gets dirty very quickly, okay? The fact that it says cleanses us from all sin is not proof text that you don't sin anymore, okay? And they will, they will borrow from later passages about he who commits sin, he cannot sin. So, you know, they'll say, well, well, he who is born of God cannot sin, right? But then they believe in conditional security. So their own definition violates those later verses. Just, just think about it. If a saved believer who has been cleansed of sin, including their propensity to sin, can then choose to sin and lose their salvation, then by definition, your definition of it, they weren't cleansed. They weren't set free. Someone who was born of God can sin and become unborn. A person born of God can sin. So they contradict their own interpretation because they, they just talk out of both sides of the mouth. I can't unpack that now. I know that's the bit that people get stuck on and I know that's the verses that people find super hard to understand and I, you know, I will get to it. I intend on getting to it. But chapters three and five are just going to have to wait to their own study. Okay, we've, we've got to get through this. We've got to do this in order. Okay. So argument number six, then, this is saying that verse nine refers to fellowship, or, or you might say relationship, I guess. So a saved believer should confess their sins in, in prayer, presumably, not for salvation. So, you know, it's got nothing to do with, says, what must I do to be saved? You know, you're still saved if you don't do it, but it's to stay in fellowship with God or with their brethren to stay in fellowship with them, such as to retain or, or recover church membership. Um, and often they'll, they'll say that fellowship is, is perhaps using it in the same way as discipleship, I guess. Um, I have previously considered this view, but really I have repented of holding this view because the, uh, what I've realised is that the problem here is really trying to define the word fellowship. Okay, because the word fellowship is it, used a handful of times in the Bible and perhaps... Um, Similar words are like relationship or, or brotherhood. And other passages use fel fellowship in like a gospel-like context, like Philemon 1.5. And so sometimes fellowship does seem like it's salvation relevant. Um, where Paul uses the word fellowship, he sometimes uses it as not associating with or participating in the needs of non-brethren and participating in things pertaining to the faith. Now, I've, I've not done like hours and hours and hours and hours of you know in-depth study about what fellowship means. But at a glance, you know, if you look at all the different verses where it means it, more commonly seems to mean association with or participation so if, if we are in fellowship with brethren it's because we associate with another you know usually other doctrines we believe right and we associate with god and so we are commanded not to be in fellowship or, or not to participate in or associate with the works of darkness right so if we say that somebody is cut off from fellowship with god like my, my problem with that view is well what does that actually mean does it do you mean that god won't answer your prayer or do you mean that god will punish you and chastise you in a non-hellfire kind of way or and and, and then if, if that's how you're interpreting it, then the next question I have to ask is, what verses in the Bible define fellowship in this way? Okay, and so it's really too much openness to what fellowship actually means if you're going to say that. So to me, this interpretation just leaves too many holes about what fellowship means. And perhaps, again, we're asserting conclusions, oh, that's what fellowship means, without really providing satisfactory proof to clearly define it and then apply it to what John is even talking about. And furthermore, if we just look at what we've been looking at, that, that you know, in this chapter, that chastisement of a disobedient believer or the consequences of disfellowshipping is not something that this epistle is talking about. OK, so we're just arbitrarily adding this definition when John himself didn't necessarily define it this way. Now, if we were doing a study on perhaps 1 Corinthians, that might be a stronger argument, but I think it's too weak in John's epistle because really what you believe about what it means is outside of the subject of John's epistle. It's, you're talking about something that John's not talking about, essentially. So with all of that, I see problems with all of the aforementioned interpretations. Obviously, there's more I could have said on that, but I think you get the idea. So um, obviously, then I need to provide justification as to what I believe it means. Now, as I've said repeatedly, John is using simple language. He's not using fancy word salad. It, it ought to be fairly simple to understand what John really means, and I believe it is. And when I recognised it, I was surprised actually how simple it is and how obvious it's just been to me the whole time. And I just completely missed it. Really, I'm, I'm summarising here, but John is tackling 
a mindset, okay? And it's about the mindset that we as believers have towards our sins and how that relates to our belief in Jesus the Christ and our fellowship, or, or you might say association with one another. So over the next few slides, let's have a look at the simple language that John uses and see if he defines his own sentences so to see if we can grasp this, okay? So we already saw earlier in this study that there's two sides here, right? This ought to give us an, an indication of what John intended in saying in verse 9. Either we say we have no sin and we say that we, you know, we have not sinned, or we confess our sins. They're, they're the two extremes. They're the opposites, okay? They're the choices, right? So verses 4 and 5 establish that we, or you and, you, you and you plural pronouns, are referring to believers, including John himself, and the people that he represents, and the group of people he is writing to, whom he predominantly calls little children throughout his epistle. So they were likely probably converts or people that John had ministered to, and John felt you know a burdening responsibility to watch over them, right? We have seen and heard. We declare unto you. We write unto you. That's who we are in chapter 1, right? Believers. Simple as that. In verses 8 to 10, we start each verse with, if we say that, or if we confess right okay so what we do is not strictly being tackled here because again sin inspectors you've got to turn from all your sin. it's not saying what we do it's saying what we say okay what we confess what we say so it's what we collectively as believers say or confess regarding our sins right now if, if john was writing about any one individual or somebody who needs to be saved he could have just said if any man or he that or whosoever but he didn't say this okay he said we that's what he said we're all together in these verses okay so John in the in the second chapter then gives us a reason why he's writing, right? Just so as to make sure that you don't misunderstand what he just said. He writes unto you that reading his writing, you do not sin. Okay, that I write unto you that you sin not. That's why he's writing, okay? Now we dealt with that if we say that, okay, we have all the verses that say if we say that, what happens if we do that? Okay, what happens if we do sin? Well, we have a condition here. Now, this is where it gets interesting because it doesn't actually say we now. Now it actually says if any man sin, right? And that's quite interesting. We're going to have to look into that. Uh, so it, it doesn't say we there, but if we, if any man sin, okay, then uh, that condition is met. Well, we have a solution. We have an advocate, okay? There's a solution there if any man happened to sin, right? 